Well, welcome back. We are in week four, and week four means that under assignments in Blackboard, you're going to do everything related to week four, and uh, that's all that stuff right there. So you have your grade, your Google Drive folders, and programming, and this is actually an outstanding assignment right here, so make sure you really take time to do the, your grade. That's all micro small, isn't it? Uh, there we go, 100%. The grade one is a uh, Fantastic, because it's going to teach you how to calculate your grade using a spreadsheet. And so when you're in a class, there's two ways they could be keeping track of your grade, the points method or the percentage method. And this video will show you all that, and uh, it's a really good skill to have. So uh, you got those. Since we're in week four, you need to do those assignments right here in Blackboard. And then the programming stuff, some people have been having some issues with the HTML and CSS. It's just like totally foreign to them. They don't get it. So if you're you know you're stuck on something in Code Academy, just make sure that uh, when you are stuck, let me just show you a couple of little tricks, All right? So let's say I'm on you know this one right here, uh, HTML Basics two, and I'm stuck on like ordered lists, and it's not working when I submit for whatever reason because. You know, let me just copy all that. Uh, you know, like, I don't know, I just have something totally stupid. It's like, oops, that didn't work. And I just can't figure out what it's doing wrong. There's this reset code right down here button. I reset that and it takes me back to the way it was at the beginning. So I just want to make sure I really read these instructions right here and then come down here and read these instructions. And then sometimes they'll even be an example, right? Like a hint. That you could say, click the hint, and it will like you know help you figure out how to do it. So uh, HTML, pretty much one of the main things you want to know is there's an opening tag and a closing tag. Pretty much on most of the tags, there's a few tags. It's not that way, but pretty much all the tags, you open them, which means that I open this heading one, right? And so that's the beginning, and everything inside here is going to have heading one applied to it. So it's all going to be heading one, and then I close it with that forward slash. I close the heading one. There I just moved it, which isn't what I wanted to do. right? And so you just have to kind of learn how the tags work together. and It's kind of an introduction to markup language. And, um, and then once you get it all in there correctly and you hit submit, it should work. Yay! All right. So that's, uh, those are your assignments in Blackboard. Is there anything else in Blackboard? Just assignments? Lectures? You can watch them, but you come to them. So. And then the other thing we have to do is, uh, is there's some extra credit in here which you might look at. That's self-explanatory. But this week, week four, do your assignments week four in Blackboard, and then come in to my IT lab. And inside my IT lab, you're going to have word assessments. So word assessment, and one, two, three, four. You're doing this one, this well, no, this one right here, three. So we're in week four, and the first week we did Windows. Second week we did this one. Third week we did this one. Fourth week we're doing this one right there. So make sure you get that one done. And under exams, we're in week four, so you need chapter quizzes. You need to do chapter four right there. All right, so you need all that stuff done. And if you have all that done, you are up to speed. You're doing great. Today, we are going to talk about software. Are you guys ready to talk about software? Before we do that, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, anecdotes, jokes, goats? Nobody has goats. If you had a goat, I'd be interested in knowing. I have a goat tea. You have a goat tea. That's interesting. So when we talk about software, like a lot of things about in academia, you're just dividing things up and categorizing them, right? Like you go into biology and like there's all this crap about categorizing different life forms. It's this type of life form. It's that type of life form. It's a vertebrae. It's a homo sapien or whatever, right? But uh, so same thing. That's what academics do. They just break things up and categorize them. And, uh, and software, hey, that's a category. When we talk about computers, computers are made up of hardware and software, right? Two halves of the same coin. You got hardware, you got software. Here's the hardware. It's hard. I'm banging on my computer for those who are watching the video and can't see that. And the software is soft. You can't bang on it, right? It's just, you know, intellectual property code that runs in your computer. Your monitor should be sideways right now, by the way because it's just too dang hard to resist the glow and you just, you just want to do stuff. And then we break up software into system software and application software. 
These are arbitrary classifications, right? It's just a way of thinking about this concept. And uh, you know, you can make up your own classifications, but these are generally the arbitrary classifications that we use. Are you in my class? Are you in my class? Yeah. Yeah? Which way should your monitor be? <laughs> I know, it's so hard to resist. Which way should your monitor be? That's the way it should be. Thank you. So break software into system software and application software. And so we can further break up system software into your operating system, your utilities, your drivers, and your translators. That's just different categories. We'll learn about all those categories. right? And we could uh, break up those just switch. That's weird. We, we could break up application software into commercial, shareware, freeware, open source, and public domain. That's all by license type, which is kind of a stupid way to break it up. But those are different licenses. So operating system, it makes your system operate, right? Name two operating systems. Uh, Mac OS. Mac OS and Windows. Name one more. Linux. Linux, perfect. Utilities are just things that help our computer run well, like disk defragment or antivirus software, right? Just like utilities help your house run well, plumbing, right? Ga gas, electricity, garbage pickup, water. That helps your house run well. Those are <coughs> utilities for your house. Likewise, utilities for our computer are software that helps our computer run well. Antivirus program, disk defragmenter, backup. So we have operating system, we have utilities. Drivers allow us to drive other pieces of hardware, right? So if I have a printer and my computer doesn't know how to work with that, I download the driver, I install it, my computer knows how to work with it. So for instance, let's say I, I go to HP's website because they're a huge manufacturer of printers. HP and support and drivers, it's one of the big links. And then when I get here, I could say I have a printer. Did you guys know that this is a touch screen? <laughs> and uh, I could just search for the printer, right? So I don't know what I'd search for. LaserJet, uh, LaserJet 1100. A, a LaserJet 100. LaserJet, LaserJet 1100. And so I'd oh, that's my printer. And then I'd come here. And I'd say, English, select your product's operating system. And the reason you need the operating system is because uh, they're built on top of different CPUs. Each operating system is built for a certain CPU. And uh, Windows just is built in a fundamentally different way than Unix, than Mac. Right? And so if I'm running uh, Windows, I need to say, hey, it's Windows 7 or uh, Windows NT or, or Unix or uh, OS 2. Right? Uh, so anyhow, I'd say like you know, Windows 7 64-bit. And then uh, I download the driver right here. And I'd install that. And then my computer would know how to drive that printer. Right? That's a driver. So that's just to illustrate what drivers are. And uh, system software is broken up into your operating system, your utilities, your drivers, and then translators, which we won't talk about. And then finally, we have uh, you know I'm application. Oh, you want to have translators? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not totally sure like why translators is in that category because it doesn't seem like it belongs there. And and what I know of translators is translators and compilers. And translators translate computer code that you wrote in a programming language, a tra uh, translator would be like for Python or for JavaScript, and it's translating it line by line, versus a compiler is going to compile all your code. And so maybe that's what the operating system, but it seems like it's a bad category. I should take that one out. So maybe I don't know what translators means, which is why I was glossing over that one. Okay. We can look that up. What the hell is that doing in that category? And then we have uh, application software, which, you know, commercial, you buy it, shareware, uh, freeware, open source, public domain. So commercial, you buy it, and then we have shareware and freeware, which is a license which you know uh, you can use it, but shareware for a limited amount of time. You know, freeware for an unlimited amount of time. You're using it, but somebody else owns it. Owns it. It might just be for a limited time. Open source. Anybody uh, can change the code. Like Linux is open source. You could download the code, change it. And, uh, and you can see the code. And, and finally, public domain is it's everybody owns it. You can do whatever you want with it. You could repackage it and sell it. It doesn't matter. It's in the public domain. 
So here's how you can think about operating systems and hardware. You have your hardware. On top of your hardware, you're, you have your operating system. And then on top of your operating system, you have application software. So it's kind of like a software stack. So you sometimes hear about software stacks. But your operating system needs to know how to work with the hardware. Right? And so there's different designs of CPUs. And, uh, and so the operating system is written for a specific CPU. Okay? And it used to be that Mac had Motorola CPUs and Windows had Intel CPUs. And so you know, they were just different the way the CPUs operated. So the operating system to run them, they were different. Right? So any application software you put on top of the operating system, they had to be different. So if you bought something for Mac, it wouldn't work on Windows. If you bought something for Windows, it wouldn't work on Mac. That's still true today. Though now, today, Macs have Intel machines. Intel CPUs, sorry. Macs have Intel CPUs so that uh, you could run Windows on them like we're doing in here. Because, you know, so they wrote the operating system for the Mac to work with the Intel CPU. Uh, and so you could also just think of application software as apps. People say apps, right? And apps are often things we're running on our mobile phones. So today what we're just going to talk about are just different application pieces of software which are your favorites. And so you, we're just going to take a quick sort of like survey of like what kind of pieces of software are out there that allow us to do stuff. It's, it's totally, I don't know, uh, it feels kind of like, uh, I just hit a wall, huh? I just went into neutral. <laughs> it, feel, it feels a little bit sort of like, eh, stuff you might already know, but maybe you'll learn something new. For instance, I have Quicken down here as my favorite. That's no longer my favorite, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to call it Mint, right? And if you go to Mint, uh, mint.com, dude, if you don't have this yet, get this, right? And it's made by Intuit right here, which are the same people that made Quicken. You download this, you, 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 you go to the website, you log in, you make an account, and then you connect all of your financial accounts to here, right? Your banks, your credit cards, your car loans, everything. And you give it all of your username and passwords for all of those different accounts, which is kind of like insane, right? Yeah. But, but this is made by really uh, trustworthy people. Otherwise, don't, don't ever do that. And so it's totally trustworthy. I know tons of people have been using it. I use it. It's been out for seven years or ten years. And, uh, and then... In one place, you get a, a complete view of what's going on in your life financially. The most important thing is it's going to download all of your transactions, all your credit card transactions. And then you could say, you know what, this transaction, this was for, you know, uh, my, my work, right? Like I'm a lawn care guy on the weekends and I take care of people's yards and, and I bought gas for it. So I'm going to categorize that as work. And I bought a bunch of stuff at the hardware store to do my lawn keeping business. I'm going to categorize all those expenditures at work. And come tax time, it'll just say, here's all the stuff you spent on work, and you can deduct that from your taxes, right? And it's just all kept. And so it, it helps save you money at tax time. And that's the, the biggest benefit of it. Not to mention, real time, you, on your phone, you just look, and yep, yep, that's all the stuff I've been spending my money on. And that, that, that will help so many, that, that's so helpful. So many people struggle financially. And, and knowing how to do your taxes, knowing how to categorize your expenditures, and, and seeing on a daily basis, like, where am I spending my money, and making sure that those are all the right transactions, and immediately being able to see, wait, that's not my transaction, right? Like, I had a transaction come through on Amazon, from Amazon.com for like 146 bucks, and I was like, hey, that's not me, so I call up my credit card, American Express, and I'm like, what's up with this transaction? They're like, well, how do you know that's not you? I never use American Express on Amazon. I've checked all my Amazon purchase history. I don't have this purchase in there. It's not me. Okay, you don't have to pay for it. Credit card companies, by the way, Truth in Lending Act, credit card companies uh, limit your liability by default, by law, to uh, $50. But what they do in practice is you don't have to pay for anything if it's fraudulent. All you have to do is call up the credit card company and file a claim and say, this isn't my charge, and you don't have to pay for it. Right? But you do have to be able to identify it and prove and you know and sign a statement saying I didn't buy this. So don't go thinking, oh, I could just start buying stuff and saying it's not my charge. Because <laughs> after you do that like four times, they'll be like, well, we're not giving you credit cards anymore. We don't know what you're doing, but you're too high risk. All right, so Mint. That's the first piece of application software, which is an absolute takeaway. Right? It's fantastic. Mint.com. Did I sell you on it? Because I get a commission. Yeah. No? Really? Are you kidding me? I don't have money to keep track of. 
<laughs> well, when you start using mint, it's like... <laughs> so the next categories are just simple, like, right? Like word processing software allows us to write documents. So Microsoft Word is obviously, you know, we're learning about that. But also on Google Drive, we're using Google Drive in this class. And so, you know, no duh, we could go into Google Drive and we could create a new document and that allows us to do word processing. And, you know, that's pretty revolutionary that we could do word processing. And uh, it used to be a typewriter, you know. And it's like that stupid old joke of, uh, uh, you know, back in the day with a typewriter, if you, uh, if you had a piece of paper, you know, and you made an error, you'd get white out and you'd paint over that error on the page. So here's like some old person, the joke. Like, oh, I don't want that. Let me paint that out. And then, you know, other people would take the white out and sniff it in high school. We have spreadsheets. So spreadsheets, word processing is to words. The spreadsheets are to numbers. It's another revolutionary killer app, right? Like made people go out and buy computers just so they could do, word, uh, do spreadsheets. But it allows you to crunch numbers. And we're using spreadsheets in here like Microsoft Excel. Or likewise in Google Drive, there's a spreadsheet, right? And it allows you to crunch numbers. And the important thing is, you know, you could do things like, uh, you know, keeping track of your, your grade, you know. And so here's a spreadsheet where I'm keeping track of the grade. And this is your assignment for this week. And uh, so I list all the things I have to do and then find an average for that category, find an average for this category, and then come over here and do the calculations. And by the way, when you do this assignment, this assignment, uh, the video is not the same as your your grade now. The percentages have changed, the categories have changed. So get the idea from the video, but then remember, oh, 50% of mine is my T lab, so your percentages are going to be different. So that's a spreadsheet. You all recognize the value of that. It's really highly demanded in the workplace. So no word processing and spreadsheet. You got to know it today. <coughs> What's up? Do you remember when uh, Microsoft used to have uh, a flight simulator in the spreadsheet? I've heard of that. I have some vague memory you of it. You used to have to like make a spreadsheet with a certain amount of rows and cells and then go to that row and cell and then click in it and then that would trigger the thing to come on. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, kind of. It was easier just to install something else and play that. Then we have uh, databases. So databases are places where we store a bunch of data. So some of the big database companies would be like Oracle, huge database company, or Microsoft SQL Server. Microsoft SQL Server. Microsoft, oh, that's MySQL. It's another big one. MS SQL Server <coughs> is Microsoft. So those are like the three big database companies. Those are traditional relational databases. And so they have relations between the tables. And they have a schema for defining how your data should be in there. And then there's a bunch of uh, newer uh, schemaless um, non-relational databases like MongoDB. Anyhow, it's where we store data. And data is cool because uh, that's basically how Facebook works. That's how everything works today. Store data, store data, store data. Get the data, know things. right? And uh, so when you look at Facebook and you're looking at somebody's feed, that's just like the things they've posted and they pull it all out and show it to you. It's all stored in the database. So that's what databases do. How many people knew databases already? How many people? It's kind of new to you. I knew they existed. Yeah, so you're aware of the concept. Um, we'll learn about databases, and I'll give you a little bit of a preview. So, uh, where do I have that? Maybe I just have it right in school. I don't think it's in there yet. Maybe it's in the spring. Maybe it's right there in the root. Big data, no. Just UF, grades, creating websites, Android programming. Let me search up here. Uh, MDB. No. Data. Big data. Um, video. No. Hmm. 
I'm going to pause this video while I find it. All right, I can't find it, but we're going to have a whole week when we talk about databases. I'm just going to give you a preview. Then we have presentation software. That's what I'm using right now. This is from Google Drive, just using it in Google Drive. And then we have application suites, which is like a whole bunch of pieces of software all sold together. So Microsoft Office is an application suite, has Word, Excel, a bunch of other stuff in it. And then we have browsers, which is what we browse the web with. And we have graphics software, which is like Photoshop, right? Or Illustrator allows us to manipulate images and pictures. And we have video editing software, which is totally cool. So we have like uh, Adobe Premiere or uh, Final Cut. Is it which is which? I think it's uh, Premiere, Final Cut. So uh, Premiere, Premiere Pro versus Final Cut Pro X. Right, so those are two ways you could edit movies, and we're going to have a movie editing assignment. You could also just use like iMovie, so I think I have iMovie in here, or you could use, um, you know, Windows Movie Maker. So video editing, that's pretty amazing, pretty phenomenal. I don't know if you realize like how incredible the times are in which you live, but like even, you know, like in the late 90s, you couldn't even edit, you don't realize it. That's good, you don't, you realize you don't realize it. <laughs> Even in the late 90s, like, you know, if you wanted to go to film school, it cost you like $40,000 to make a movie. And you'd have to shoot it on, you know, whatever celluloid film and, and edit it in an old-fashioned way, actually cutting the film. Now it's like anybody with their phone can shoot a movie and edit it right on your phone and upload it and share it with the whole world. It's like, holy cow. Web-based software, software that only runs in the web. It's also maybe like, you know, just known as the cloud so, right, this entire Google Drive thing, I'm just running this, you know, I mean, yeah, I download a lot of the stuff and it runs on my computer through the browser, right, but this is all stuff that's running on the web, right? It's not like I had to download and install Microsoft, or I didn't have to download and install, like, Google Drive Document Maker, right, or whatever that software would be called, it's just, what's up? Is a lot of software switching to that web-based software just to prevent piracy? Because it seems like like Adobe Photoshop now is always yeah, yeah. web based yeah, thing yeah. or whatever, and it's a uh, subscription based. And yeah. You can't pirate that. Yeah, yeah. What was that, Ladon? They get rid of Adobe. Well, that's a constant. Don't buy us off. The summer. They're trying to get away, get away from Adobe. It's going to something else. I don't know where it is. Huh. Adobe will still be around, but they did yeah. switch from like the old model of here's your software, install it, to a newer model where you still install a bunch of software, but it's more connected with the web. Uh, Computer-based training is any, like my, my IT lab, right? You're using some software to teach you something on your computer. Uh, so where we've been, where we're going, that's pretty much the question, you know, people look at trying to, I mean, one of the things... But we are, where we've been is uh, software focused on productivity, killer apps, spreadsheet, word processing. That was, that was where, we, where we've been. And now, you know, software focuses on connectivity, ubiquity. It's everywhere. It's personalized. It's transparent. You don't even, you're not even aware it's happening. You know, and so that, the, the killer apps, that's what people ask themselves. What are the next killer apps? I just got this text from my buddy, Job. Let's see if I can bring it up. He sent me this text right here. And so he had a, a friend, he, he, you know, me and my friend Job are kind of older dudes. And uh, back in the day, we, whatever, but there's this kid that was growing up in Job's neighborhood who was like 15 years old and coding the hell out of stuff and like taught himself calculus so he could use it in coding and, and, and then, you know, got a really great job, you know, coding in L.A. and like revolutionized the way actors get paid because he took all this data and just crunched it and basically gave him a market value. <laughs> I don't know how he did all that. But then he's created this thing called Place of Vote. It's just like this kid who grew up over by, by Palm and Herndon, you know? And uh, he created Place of Vote, and this was just the other day in Bloomberg, and he's trying to revolutionize, you know, democracy now and have this entire thing where, you know, it's not quite so much like uh, we just elect a representative and then they go to Congress and the people we elect are the ones who got funded by the, got the most funding to campaign. And so since they got all this funding to campaign, they're now beholden to the people who gave them the funding. So they're really representing whatever interests gave them the funding to get them into office as opposed to representing the people, right? And so he's saying, well, let's change that. And, uh, and you know, the representatives will just vote on each issue. I don't know, it's just this entire thing, but... It's gaining a lot of momentum and traction, and Bloomberg picked it up and, and put it up as one of the things that are is going to maybe change the world, and it's 
in good company, man. SpaceX. That was created by the same dude who created uh, Tesla and PayPal. So I, uh, I, they, they came to me and, you know, um, uh, I'm just like, oh, crap, all this personal stuff's flying up. They came, they came to me uh, and they, they were like, hey, do you want to help out? And I'm like, what's my cut? And they're like, man, why are you worrying about that? And I'm like, well, I don't want to get involved unless I know my cut. And they're like, just do it because it's cool. I'm like, no, nah, man, you know, let's talk about, all right, we'll each take whatever, 10%, a third, whatever. So they just went on, but now it's gaining momentum. Maybe I should have just done it because it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I've, uh, I didn't know the dude. My, my friend knew the dude, so he was cool with it. So when you get software, uh, you have to know the minimum system requirements. Uh, or sometimes that's, that's what you look at. So with my IT lab, right, uh, uh, you could do minimum system requirements and uh, my IT lab uh, right system requirements here tells you hey you need this sort of an operating system windows right you need that kind of a browser and um, you need this much hardware processing power and so that's just when you buy software there's system requirements so sometimes you could say what are the system requirements but hopefully you have a good enough machine you don't have to worry about it there's a ULA in user license agreement. So anytime you buy software, you're not buying the software. You're buying the right to use the software. You're buying a license, right? And so um, you can't just go to the corner and say, hey, I bought Microsoft Office and make a whole bunch of copies and start selling it. What, officer? I bought it. Why can't I sell it? I bought it. I made a bunch. No, you bought the right to use it once. You already know this, right? So you can't go out and copy it and sell it or give it away. That's pirating. So that's defined in the end user license agreement. That's the thing you never read and just always click accept. Though, however, uh, there is a company um, money. Uh, that's for the end user license agreement. You can't just buy like um, one AutoCAD and for the whole office and use it for like each computer. So uh, it, man finds a $1,000 prize in end-user license uh, agreement. So one company actually put into their end-user license agreement, if you're actually reading this, email us and let us know you read it, and we'll send you 1000 bucks. And so he's like, dude, so I read your thing, and do I get 1000 bucks? You're like, yeah, totally, you read it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just to the first person, right? But, and then they got some publicity from it, so nice little stunt. So that's, uh, you know, here is a description of commercial, shareware, freeware, public domain. Don't stress it too much in this class with learning all the terminology. Just know, hey, there's some software you buy that's commercial. There's some software that you could just use that's like shareware or freeware or whatever. In public domain, you need to know, right? That's just like everybody owns that. So when we talk about intellectual property, that's what we're talking about now. Intellectual property, IP, intellectual property. So there's real property, which means you can physically touch it. It's real, right? So real estate, that's real property right real property is this real property ah. yes I could touch it is this real property is this real property yeah I was thinking you knew that's not real property I was gonna try to sing but I can't think of a song Mary had a little lamp that's not real property right you can't grasp that it's a thought it's intellectual you could record it on a CD and the CD's real property Right, but what has value is not that little plastic CD, right? It's those that intonation, the words, the rhythm, right? That you know, all Bruce Springsteen put to all of that album, and and that's what has value. It's not the tw twenty cent CD that it's sitting on, and so that's intellectual property, things you can't touch, and so that's where like songs, movies, screenplays, books, software, right? I can't touch that. That's just ideas. That's intellectual property, and so. In intellectual property, one of the categories is public domain, and that means it's owned by everybody, right? And so things that are in the public domain, you know, you could go and you could say, uh, you could just Google songs in public domain, songs in public domain, and here's a, a list of songs in the public domain. You can start listening to them, right? And then Kurt Cobain, you guys ever hear that song? Um, uh, what is it? It's a... Uh, Nirvana in the Pines. Nirvana in the Pines, right? You ever hear that one? Yeah, great song. But that's an old Lead Belly blues song. And he's like, I like that song. And it's in the public domain. So he just took it and made a cover of it. And he didn't have to pay anybody for it, right? Versus like, you know, uh, 
Um, uh, what's this dude's name? It is, uh, uh, I can't think of it. Anyhow, there's this other guy who's a singer. <laughs> And he sampled like a James Brown riff in a song, just like a second of it, or three seconds of it, and like the lawyers came after him. It's like, really? I sampled like four seconds of James Brown, and you're coming after me when all this other stuff's happening in the world? So he wrote a song about that, too. <laughs> I included that in one of his other songs. It's uh, pretty rough when it's just like four seconds of a song, and then they assume what the... Quite a bit of Michael Franti is the dude's name. What's that? It's pretty rough when they do that. I mean, yeah. It's like, it's yeah. still an original song. Well, it's property. Somebody else owns yeah. it. You can't use it without asking them. So, uh, piracy and intellectual property. Piracy is stealing software. And, uh, you know, there's a great 60 Minutes. I think I mentioned this already about the guy who wanted to be the James Bond villain. And his oh, name yeah. was uh, Kim.com. Right? 60 Minutes Kim.com. Where he's like, you know, people say facilitating piracy. Um, Download.com is a good place to sometimes download software. And open source Windows, another place sometimes you can find stuff. That's kind of old. I haven't been there in a long time. I haven't updated these slides in a long time. I mean, I looked through them today, but they could use a little more updating. Anyhow, that's software. Let's uh, look through the book and look at our key terms. Did you bring yours by any chance? Awesome. Uh, I'll pause this while I come get it. I got mine in my office if you're tired of me using yours. Here are the key terms from Chapter 3. And I look at a lot of this stuff, and I just think, yeah, who cares, right? And uh, so aggregator, I don't, you know, whatever, who cares? A blog, right, that's where people sort of write their whatever daily update, a blog. Bookmarks, we have bookmarks in a browser, so up here are my bookmarks. And I could add things to my bookmarks, and I could come over here, and I could say, hey, I want to I manage my bookmarks. And I could go in, and I could look at all my bookmarks. So I could go to the bookmark manager. And then here are all the bookmarks. And so I have a folder here for Go programming, and I could look at all those links, or for Android, and I could look at all those links. And so I could just keep track of different websites. Those are bookmarks. Uh, Boolean operators uh, in programming are like AND or OR. Right, those are Boolean operators. So you say, uh, you know, uh, 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 what would be a good example of and is I'm hungry and it's Wednesday. If I'm hungry and it's Wednesday, uh, go to Whole Foods during lunch because they have Indian, Indian fry bread on Wednesday at lunch. Right? <laughs> like that's like if both of those are true, that's and, right? Or an or statement would be uh, if I'm hungry, or I'm just bored, go get something to eat, right? Either of those are true, I'm going to go do it. So that's a Boolean operator, right? And use that in programming to do different stuff. Hey, if this and that, then do this. Um, and then breadcrumb trails, you know, some websites back in the day, not, well, maybe there's one in here. So when I go into Drive, I'm done with that, and I start clicking into things, I start getting a breadcrumb trail up here, right? And, uh, and it starts telling me where I'm at, and I could go oh, back there. So that's a breadcrumb trail. When e-commerce and the web first came about, people started to talk about different web business models. And so like business to business or business to consumer or consumer to consumer, those are like the different models. Like, you know, consumer to consumer would be like Amazon. It's bringing together a buyer and a seller, and Amazon's a broker in the middle taking a cut. So that's consumer to consumer. Business to business would be like, I don't know you know, uh, Salesforce, right? Salesforce is a business, and that's not right. Salesforce needs to bring one business, or business to business needs to bring one business together with another business. But you get the idea. So those are just different models. They're, nobody talks about that anymore. And then we have clients and client server networks. And so when we talk about networking, we'll talk about um, protocols and architecture and topology. And architecture would be network architecture. Let's just look at an image. Network architecture. And uh, uh, I'm just looking to see if I'm using the right phrase even. All of a sudden, I'm having a moment of doubt. Hang on one second. Yeah, so that's right. So the next, the, the, sometimes there's different words that people use to talk about that stuff. So the architecture is client to client or, or client to server or peer to peer. And uh, so if we look at client-server architecture, let's just see what we get here. There's a nice picture. 
So you have uh, all these clients, and then they connect to a server, and so they make requests, and then the server fulfills those requests. So that's client-server architecture. And then there's also peer-to-peer -peer architecture, and um, that would look like, you know, any client, you know, anybody is connecting with anybody else, right? So the server is just facilitating connections between clients. And so famous peer-to-peer -peer is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, but we'll learn more about that. And yeah, we will. We'll learn more about that. So domain name is uh, the address of you know, up here, like, you know, you could go to mcclouds.com and there's my mom's website. For real? Yeah. yeah. Right? She sells homes. It's kind of <clears throat> old. And uh, it's way old. What am I talking about? And then you could buy a domain just by going to Google Domains. And you could buy domains. And, uh, sorry, it brought up my personal account. Let's close that. So you could buy domains. And then, um, you know, you buy a domain and then you could build a website for it. So Google Domains is a great place to go to. Let me bring that up in a different browser. I just have client information in there and stuff like that that I don't want to show. So this is kind of cool. So, uh, David? Yes. What's your last name? Chigger, C H I G E R. C H I G E R. DavidChigger.com. $12 a year, you should totally go buy it. Nobody has it yet. I, I don't have $12. If I search for <laughs> ToddMcLeod.com, somebody has it. And it's not me. What are, some other, what are they doing with it? Yeah. So I could do a, a who is right here, look up who is, and I could see maybe who owns it. And it's bought at GoDaddy, bad place to buy it. And, uh, and it's uh, some dude in Long Beach. I've looked him up, and he's a musician. Huh. Todd at RedTreeRecords.com. <clears throat> kind of interesting. So that's domains. It's Why good is uh, GoDaddy a bad place to buy because it's not Google. Do they charge yeah. more? Do they not keep track of it better? Um, that's a good question. That's a fair question. Why don't I like GoDaddy? Uh, I like. I'm kind of like Google, and and Google, you could take your domain and easily host it with them, and do App Engine stuff with it, and build a site right in there once you bought it. And Google, to me, is like the best player on the internet and they know how to do things the quickest and they have the best system content delivery network so system of network computers around the world and so they know how to deploy and deliver information to people in the most effective way and anybody else that's out there um, you don't know how well they do that like GoDaddy is just GoDaddy like what does GoDaddy do they sell domains I don't know and they sell something else and then they try to sell you a whole lot of other stuff I don't really like the imaging of GoDaddy it's like if you look at their commercials right it's like really what's that girl at the Super Bowl in a bikini have to do with domains right I don't know right and even you know kind of like you know it's just like you know there's just like a, I feel like I just kind of went into Walmart or someplace that's like trying to sell me a lot of stuff you know versus just give me my domain and let me do my hosting and the main reason the technical reason is I don't know the system and I haven't learned their system and the reason I didn't learn it is because I don't they aren't to me as good as Google about delivering content that's not their specialty so if I'm going to deliver content I want to use the people who know how to deliver content better than anybody else in the world and have been more successful than anybody else in the world. And I want to ride on their system, right? I want to, and, and so the, the more you could kind of go along with their stuff, the better is my thought. That's domains. Domains, good question. E-commerce, electronic commerce. So that's what e-commerce stands for. How many people this is helpful for me just to go through the key terms? How many people is totally boring, waste of your time, and you wish you could be texting? <laughs> I don't know, sometimes email, fair is, file transfer protocol, host, 
hypertext transfer protocol. So some some uh, IP addresses. So there's a little bit of that protocol stuff in there. Sounds like there's a little bit of networking stuff in here. So protocol is a rule of communication. So we have communication protocols in here in our class. Am I still recording? 3957, 408, good. So we have rules of communication in this class, right? And one of the rules of communication is I face you and I talk to you and I try to look at you occasionally but not make too much eye contact so that's weird. Don't want to stare at somebody too long. It becomes uncomfortable, right? And so we have all these subtle rules of communication that we all know but we don't talk about. And, uh, and then, you know, we have ways to deal with collisions when two people talk at the same time. Oh, 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 no, you, you go first. All right, and, uh, and it's usually one person talks, the other listens. So we have all these rules of communication. Just like we have rules of communication or protocols for communication, computers have protocols for communication. And so there's HTTP, which is the hypertext transfer protocol. HTTP, it's a rule for communicating with hypertext documents over the internet. We have TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, which is kind of the layer underlying HTTP. And, uh, and then what else do we have? TCP and then Internet Protocol IP addresses. And so we saw my mom's, we saw my mom, uh, my mom's website. And we could go to uh, the terminal here and I could do, um, uh, what do I want to do? Uh, and so I do ping mcclouds.com and it shows me the IP address. And this is really where that computer is located. So if I went to 7929 72293140, 72293140. Hopefully I got that right. Otherwise we might look at an adult entertainment site. 72293140. All right, and now that's spinning. But that's the address of my mom's website. And there's my mom's website. Coming up very slow. Maybe because the people here don't know how to deliver content, you know. <laughs> Command Q. Close. So you just learned protocol, right? Rules of communication. You learned architecture, client server, peer to peer. You learned HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. It's hypertext because the document you transfer is HTML, hypertext markup language. And so the guy who created the web back in the 90s uh, was uh, 90s creative Tim Berner-Lee, right? He was an engineer at CERN, and that was the Center for European Nuclear Research. And uh, they were sending documents back and forth, but they were just text. And he said, there's a better way. And so he said, let's mark it up and let's put in H1 tags for headings and P tags for paragraphs. And he created hypertext markup language and we could have links, right? So if you want to reference something, you can just click the link and it takes you to that other resource. And so you put that code into your document. We'll call it a hypertext markup HTML document, right? Then uh, when you receive that, you can have a special piece of software which will look at it and look at all that code and then turn it into a web page, right? And then you could read it and you could have headings and you could have links. And so I came up with that idea, HTML, and hypertext is a key thing. And then that became the web, which is different than the internet because the internet's been around since the 60s, but the web started in the 90s, right? And the internet used to just be, um, you know, so internet map original. Right, the internet just used to be, this was the internet originally, and it was just like UC uh, LA and Stanford and uh, I think one other location, but that was it originally, you know, and then they slowly added a few other colleges on, but they designed the internet as part of a, a project at DARPA, and DARPA is Defense Advanced Research Projects, and so they do really fascinating stuff, uh, all designed around you know, military and defending or attacking, having good weapons. And uh, they wanted to create a network that would allow people to communicate in the event of a nuclear war. Uh, so if, um, you know, you're on a phone, that's a phone is a switch network, right? So it's like you create a switch. If I'm here in UCLA, well, let's do, uh, yeah, let's do RAN, SDC, whatever that is. If I'm here in SDC and I'm talking to Illinois, and Utah gets blown up, and that's the phone line. I'm no longer talking to Utah. I'm no longer talking to Illinois. 
with a packet switching, it finds whatever route with routers, right? Routers. And so I'm talking, and, and I'm no longer going through Utah because it got blown up. Then I just go down here, I go over here, I go there, I go here, and then I'm still talking to them. So you can lose cities, have your communication infrastructure be broken up by bombs, and still be able to communicate. Your communication wouldn't be broken. That's how the internet originally started. And uh, that was in the 60s, and then the worldwide, and then the academic institutions started using it, and, uh, and then they created this hypertext markup language deal. So, the semantic web is uh, this concept of uh, having our websites have meaning, the code in them, right? And so we used to just do a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, div statements to categorize different things or paragraph statements. And, um, and so then they came up with these different semantic tags. Let's see if this HTML5 doctor is better. And the semantic tags would say, hey, this is an article. So we have an article tag, or this is a section, or this is a header, this is a heading, this is a footer. I'm just looking to see if they have any of the tags here. So there's article. I don't know. They don't have a list of them. So that's the semantic web. And then search engines can look at that and understand what's going on with your page a little bit better. So some of the concepts from chapter three and chapter four deals with software. I'm just looking at the terms here. We talked about enough of this stuff. Anybody have any questions? How many people that was worth an hour of your life? Sure. How many people that was not worth an hour of your life? <laughs> it's like, man, I knew all that stuff. You just cost me an hour <coughs> of my life. It was worth it to know anyway. How many people learned something new? All right, so why don't you just take a moment in your group, introduce yourself. My name is Billy Bob Thornton, and uh, this is what I learned today. The new thing I learned, or one of the new things, is this. And then once you've all done that, you can work for the rest of class. I have no work at the moment.